Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Dr. Sophie Cote as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. Today we're here to explore deliberate practice in psychotherapy and how to enhance therapeutic effectiveness and outcomes for clients. Sophie is an expert in memory reconsolidation for humans and animals and has a private practice in Quebec, Canada. She is an associate instructor of coherence therapy at the Coherence Psychology Institute and has founded the Francophone Institute of Therapeutic Memory Reconsolidation, which offers workshops, training, deliberate practice and certification for memory reconsolidation and coherence therapy. She has co-written two handbooks about the therapeutic reconsolidation process and coherence therapy and has been teaching that framework for the last 10 years in North America, Europe and North Africa. Sophie, great to have you. I'd it's love great to... to be here. Yeah, I'd love to jump in and yeah, let's talk a little bit about deliberate practice. Let's. Yeah, do you want to perhaps, based on what you know, kind of define it a little bit for people um, who may not be so sure about what it is and that would be a good place for us to start. One way to think about it is to think about psychotherapy sessions as the performance uh, maybe it is the competition match or maybe it is a concert versus deliberate practice being the time you spend between sessions, honing your skills, um, trying new things and trying to improve very specific areas of your practice in order to improve the next performance that you will do in the next session. Deliberate refers to um, the distinction between what uh, some, uh, I think it is uh, Eric Anderson, um, the difference they make between naive practice and deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is about targeting specific skills or mi even micro skills and um, thinking about specific exercises that you can do over and over again and exercises that will be definitely outside your comfort zone, just, just enough outside your comfort zone. So it is hard, but not so hard that you get discouraged and you give up, um, that you will practice over and over again in order to uh, become more fluid, in order to make it more automatic, um, as you do your sessions with your patients. And this is what has been proven empirically uh, to improve your success rate as high as 95% of your clients. So it is a big deal. Yeah, a really big deal. And I imagine there's some um, but the fulfillment you feel too. And <laughs> with, that, with that percentage being like, oh, seeing the results of this deliberate practice, and I imagine it's less about, well, I'll ask you, less about just a specific intervention, but also about what happens in you in the therapy session and working on um, like your own block, perhaps, to doing something or being some way. Is that is that accurate? It's a whole range of, of skills. You can, you can do deliberate practice, for example, then some institutes are really great at creating little videos that, that you can practice with. For example, when a client is angry at you or when a client is really vague or very tangential and you, you need to practice how to bring the client gently, respectfully, but firmly towards uh, the, the subject that you were working on. That's a skill in itself. But also certain attitudes, certain clinical situations can trigger some things in you as well. And sometimes it's not always about your own schemas as a therapist that you need to transform. Sometimes it's really about getting skilled at handling the situations the way optimally, uh, optimally you would like to handle them. That takes practice definitely as well. It's a lifelong endeavor, really. But it makes it interesting and fresh and new, and it keeps things alive throughout a whole a whole career. So it's really, um, you know, we call it like you know when you're you're in private practice, as if the you know sixty minutes is the practice. But it seems like you said that that's the show, the performance, that's the, show. The, the practice that happens between, which um, which I think makes a lot of sense, especially when you come out of kind of grad school 
and you know nothing about anything and they're like well go on go and see your clients but then you're like okay so i better be doing some deliberate practice um and you know what's scary about that what is scary about the research on deliberate practice and therapists is that actually when you come out of uni university your um your performance and your success rate is the highest it will be in your whole career over time as years pass by you will get less and less and less effective at, at what you do experience is there but it doesn't make you actually better at what you do it makes you more experienced and research has has demonstrated this so it's really important to to keep some element of deliberate practice if you actually want to improve your level instead of losing your efficacy over time no matter what kind of experience you have that's one thing and the one of the other things that research has shown about deliberate practice is that those therapists who reach that 95-ish percent of efficacy, what uh, Scott D. Miller calls the, the super shrinks, they actually invest 2.5 more time uh, between sessions to deliberate pra practice than the average therapist. And that's what explains their high level of efficacy among other factors. Wow, that's really a profound statistic that you get a little bit worse over time if you just stick to what you know out of college. And it actually applies to, to many, many things. As a driver, you get worse over time. And not just because you age and your reflexes are different. And you're, it's, you, you, it's, it's the very same thing with so many things, so many skills in life, not just therapy. Uh, that experience will not help you get better. It's the it's a kind of deliberate practice that will. Yeah, and the deliberate practice is not about just practicing already what you know. It's like you said, going outside a little bit of your comfort zone that's manageable so you don't feel defeated and like heading towards that, right? Absolutely. And the same goes for, for practice per se. If you keep practicing um, skills that are not uh, quite uh, attuned or aligned with what uh, what's needed for you to reach the next level. Same thing, you can invest as many hours as you can. You can practice and practice and practice, you won't get better. So you actually need some ways to make sure that what you are actually practicing are not in your blind spot or are, are, are um, effective at raising your level of efficacy uh, you, how that's that's why it takes some kind of of coaching even, even if it's just your own if you film yourself practicing then mm -hmm. you can look at yourself afterwards and then see if you are actually applying the the skill correctly where you could improve your micro skills and so on and so forth and of course if you have a trainer with you that can be hugely helpful because you cannot um and filming now that we're mentioning it i will i will insist on that point in supervision i i offer people to either do role plays uh in in the the groups and in the sessions or to film themselves with patients who are obviously consenting to this in order to to watch them work to watch them apply the skills because if they just tell me about what they think they do in their sessions how can they tell me about their blind spots they don't see them so that's my role to help them see their blind spots and where they can target their deliberate practice in order to be to be more effective in the months to come Wow, it is, that's it is, and and it is. It makes people anxious uh, when you begin filming yourself. You're scared of what you're going to see. Am I going to be, you know, uh, really, really worse than what I can imagine? What am I going to see? Am I going to like myself? It's it's um, self conscious and it's uncomfortable at the beginning. But when you start aiming for specific improvements for specific skills. It's it's almost like it becomes kind of a game that you can play with yourself because with each session, with each show, you have a new chance of improving just a little bit 
at something specific that you set up for yourself. And it's, it's um, stimulating and it's uh, even a, a joy, a joyful practice that you can renew over and over and over again. So it's actually very um, stimulating, very motivating, even if you, if, if you feel a little bit uncomfortable at first, it goes away, I promise. Yeah, I bet there's a lot of people thinking that sounds intense. But it's it sounds like it's less about, oh, let's just watch you practice for the sake of it. It's like, no, you're identifying these spots that could be tweaked or improved. And then I imagine, like you said, seeing the growth, however small, is, is probably really wonderful to, to see. And it also is, speaks to how supervision generally is, because typically people come in and they just think about, talk about their own sense of what their blind spots in without anybody really looking at it which i imagine could be um not helping that curve <laughs> that you talked about <laughs> at the beginning get any better um, definitely and i had a i still have a, a very good friend who would coach his his group they they, they are a, a marching band and all he did was film the practices film film the rehearsals and most of people just seeing themselves, they saw where they were sticking out of the line or where they were not in sync with the rest of the crew and corrected themselves on their own just by watching the short videos that he uh, that he shared with the group. So it's a it's a highly effective tool indeed. And if you watch if you watch your sessions, for example, and you have no goal in mind. You're just watching yourself to find out everything that could be improved with your 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 practice. It's going to be very um, uh, what's the word? Uh, unmotivating, if if I if I can say it that way. You're going to pinpoint every single little thing that you could improve. Whereas when you have a, a deliberate practice plan, you're actually working on maybe three or four max skills for several months. And that's all that you watch for. The rest of the stuff that you see going on, you let go. You're actually just focusing on these specific micro skills that you want to improve. And that makes it a much easier, much happier experience for you to watch yourself work in those uh, conditions. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Imagining watching the whole thing and going, man, I've got, I've got all of these things I need to do is probably intense, but it sounds really specific and focused. And I was going to ask you a question about how, like when you get supervisees, what's your starting process with them in terms of setting them up for deliberate practice? Does that make sense? You mean how I get them on board? with the whole del deliberate practice idea yeah get them on board like start i mean you know in my mind i'm like okay does, does sophie just say okay when you come to supervision bring a recorded session we're going to watch it together you know that, that oh yeah that's good. that's usually the reaction you get yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually the reaction you get for the reasons that we talked about because people feel self-conscious and they haven't done it since university uh, it's been a long time. They have no idea what's what it's going to look like, and they, they they are very nervous about it. But then I simply talk about why they're there. They want to get good at the type of therapy that they want to work on with me. They want to um, they want to become more fluid. They want to increase their speed and obviously their efficacy. And I just let them know: look, we have several options to do that. I had one supervisee who was so nervous about showing what she did. The way she adapted it for herself was to record it, watch it herself, and then write the whole verbatim, and then present the maybe maybe 10 minutes of verbatim that she wanted us to work on when things were a little bit sticky and they were all a bit clunky. And just from the verbatim, we had enough to, to work on, to see what, what was going on in her, um, in the way she was applying the framework that she wanted to improve. And then it was, uh, it was perfectly okay for her in those, uh, in that format. So you find, you find ways to adjust the deliberate practice format in a way that will help people feel more comfortable with it. Like I said, it's hard 
uh, harder than what you would be comfortable with, but not so hard that experientially you need to survive your experience. You need to protect yourself from the intensity of your experience. And then of course you will not integrate it because you're so busy surviving the whole thing and getting to the other side. It's not a great condition for, for learning or unlearning or transformation as we know. So that's, that's usually what I tell them that from experience, the people who improve um, in, in supervision are the ones who show me in one way or the other, how they apply the framework. And um, and then from then on, we can design a kind of deliberate practice that suits them. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just about, this is the way we're doing it and you need to do it. It's like, let's get... Here's the program. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hopefully, no. <laughs> yeah, because like you said, like if you're, if you're a trainee and you're in an activated state, and you know your prefrontal cortex is offline. <laughs> You're not going to learn anything in the in doing that type of practice. So really, you are sort of meeting them where they're at, nudging them towards some form of um, deliberate practice which is manageable for them. Which sounds really great. Yeah, and and usually some twenty minutes a week. It's not the end of the world but if you do it well. That twenty minutes can really make a pretty good difference in the way you will feel applying any given framework of psychotherapy over time. You mean 20 minutes of looking at some part of the session, you know, doing the rehearsal? Deliberate, the deliberate practice can be so many things. It can be, um, it can be looking at yourself uh, or it can be also what I like to suggest them to do. I have a couple of demos. It's in French. Maybe one day I will I will publish also demos in English. It's it's role plays of uh, coherence therapy sessions. And then what I tell them, uh, what I suggest them to do is to watch the video. And then when they see I'm I'm taking a, a breath to answer, to pause the video, and then imagine what they would do, what they would say in my if they were in my place, if they were the therapist. That's also a form of deliberate practice. And then obviously you can listen to my answer, which is the model, um, and then compare your answer to mine and then see what you need to, to, to work on or to improve that way. That's also a form of deliberate practice. In coherence therapy, we have a very important tool, which is writing index cards. It, it, there are several micro skills involved in uh, designing an index card in coherence therapy. If you really look at it, there's several things. You have to have high quality limbic language, it has to be alive. It has to be involved emotionally. It really has to come from the problematic model of reality that you're working on or the schema that you're working on. And then th there's something about the structure and it need, needs to be on point. It needs to be uh, streamlined um, and so on and so forth. So all the parts of the schema map need to be there in the right place. And then it has to flow, it has to pop, it has to really help the patient integrate and then inhabit uh, vividly their emotional truth and their pro symptom position and so on. So in itself, practicing writing good index cards is definitely deliberate practice. Also, it's more of a paper and pen or computer uh, uh, task, <clears throat> but still, it's it uh, falls definitely into uh, the category of deliberate practice. And I know capturing, you know, um, the limbic quality of a of a schema is super important. And if it's too watered down, it can not quite sort of pack the punch that is necessary. Especially when you're thinking often that it's a child's learning or experience that you know i think as adults we could easily explain it away as yeah that was hard when so that happened and then you're like well wait like from a kid's perspective and capturing that on a card is a real skill it is too many times that's that's one of the things that i work on in supervision is to help people make the difference between a very good very astute very um just and correct clinical explanation of what is going on or clinical description of what is going on. But it's not what you would hear if you snuck a microphone under the nose of the schema just as it is being activated. And what, what would come out 
with no filter, right on spot. That's what you want to hear in an index card. And it takes work. It takes practice to be able to um, to, to 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 make it come up as a really it's a second language, learning lambic language that way. I I suggest people to when they watch series, when they watch movies to practice listening to the emotional truths that are being expressed without interpreting, just getting what's being expressed from, from the gut feeling, uh, sometimes a little bit between the lines, sometimes it's just out there. That's also deliberate practice that you can do in, in your free time. It never stops. So it's it, there are so many ways to do this and to enjoy this as well. Yeah, I mean, it adds this kind of richness to the work. I mean, just speaking from personal experience coming out of school and being like, well, I guess this is it. I guess I guess now I'm a therapist. I think I would I don't think I would have lasted in my career if I if if I would have just done that and carried on. I would have probably been bored, lost interest. Whereas this is kind of stimulating and you know, everyone is a therapist because they want to help and being able to help more intentionally and effectively is a really wonderful possibility um yeah so it does sound intense but sort of almost i don't know some part of me that's like well there isn't any other option <laughs> well maybe there is if you don't you know i mean some people perhaps are comfortable doing not doing that but i feel like knowing that it's out there and you can improve in these micro ways and that improves outcomes for clients is really important it, it has so many levels. Uh, research apparently has shown that succeeding, having successful um, sessions that yield real, lasting, profound results is actually a factor for our psychological health as therapists. If uh, the more successful you are as a therapist in your interventions, uh, the more protected you are against burning out. So if you keep feeling frustrated that you're not quite achieving what you want in terms of results, whatever um, efficacy means to you in your framework of therapy, of course, it can vary a bit widely from framework to framework. Whatever it means to you, um, feeling that you are... are reaching that level of efficacy from one session to another. Just think about how you feel when your session went so-so. Forget, you know, badly. Sometimes, unfortunately, it happens. We have ups and downs. But then just so-so. It was an okay session, but you feel it could have been more for the patient. Remember how you feel in those situations and imagine experiencing that several times during the week. It will drag you down psychologically as a as a therapist so it's really important that we set ourselves up for success even for, for for that not just for the clients obviously that we want we want the best for them but it's also the best for us in terms of uh, burnout and um, general satisfaction with our work yeah i was gonna say like your own kind of sustenance for the for doing the work you know setting up that you're confident you can sort of deepen into someone's emotional world and and, and intentionally um, support transformational change or, or growth is um, makes the career a lot more sort of addictive <laughs> than yes. oh, I had another I, I had another session that was you know felt all right but it was you know I knew there was more like that's a bit sort of um, disheartening and than the other the other piece of it. Mm -hmm. sure. Because the other the the other <laughs> experience is so profoundly satisfying. It's just so profoundly satisfying when you just score with the way you want it to score um, in terms of results. That's just so satisfying, and it and, and you show up to the next session and you're refreshed, even though you spent a whole session with uh, a patient just before you have. You have a spring in your step and you're energized and intellectually you're awake and you're fully there. And it's so much easier to um, to carry on the, the performance in your next show. 
and then the next, and then the next. It really helps you get through get through your day while maintaining that nice, satisfying energy. And at the end of the day, of course, you know you're less you're less tired, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you're going into every session with your cup full. Yes. <laughs> R- rather than the sort of drained, like, oh, that was hard and didn't get anywhere. And it's, we're r- sort of spinning our wheels, that kind of, that's tiring. And, uh, oh, I feel 150 you. when I come out of a session like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and so those are the sessions. 150 years old. I feel, I feel so old and tired and drained when I come out of a session like that. So, yeah. We know now that there are things, concrete things that we can do to avoid that as much as possible. So, yeah. So those sessions, perhaps, are they are they good sessions to use in this deliberate practice, like a recording or a transcript of a session like that? I definitely record my uh, most difficult patients. Definitely, definitely. It's a yeah. way, it's a way that's something that's been on the back of my mind since the, since the beginning of our great conversation um, is um, empowerment, how to feel less trapped in your practice by what you can't quite un- unlock in, in your sessions. You know that there is a way that you can actually work your way out of those roadblocks or <clears throat> those dead ends or those sticky situations that you keep finding yourself into. There is actually a way out. There is actually something that you can do that's accessible, that you can do at your own pace, um, that you, that can empower you and that can, can literally help you feel less powerless with those clinical situations. So it's also very comforting to know that uh, that practice is there. Really comforting. I was just thinking about how it could be easy to go, well, that's just this type of client that can't do this type of work. You know, like sort of almost giving up because you're exhausted. <laughs> and now it's like, well, this there's something I could be doing to make sure I'm showing up for this client in the most effective way possible for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have with- to endure. I don't have to endure this. There is actually something that I can do. I don't have to endure this again and again and session after session and just doing my best, but then knowing that it's not getting us where we could get. I don't have to endure. There is something that I can do to make this better for both of us. Isn't that great? Really great. Um, I was going to ask you earlier on, you kind of mentioned setting up like role plays where where supervisees play their clients and i wondered if you had a sense of um how how the the difference in learning between doing a role play where you're playing the client and just working on an actual your own issue with a colleague you know what i mean like do you see a difference in or better difference in the benefits of those types of setups does that make sense oh yeah definitely it does there are certainly benefits of um, getting getting the psychotherapy, getting the intervention for yourself and your own improvement, your own issues. But when you play one of your patients, uh, especially your most difficult patients that you bring in supervision, of course, you bring them in supervision because you're blocked somewhere. Uh, almost inevitably, uh, people who go through that experience either with uh, a partner or in role play with me. What they experience in in some key moments of psychotherapy is uh, very often an aha moment for them because as they get um, involved uh, in, 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 in trying to portray and trying to inhabit their client's perspective through obviously uh, empathy or coherence empathy in in coherence therapy, uh, symptom coherence empathy. And they're trying to really inhabit their patient's emotional truths. And you guide the steps of, in my case, coherence therapy with them or the therapeutic reconsolidation process in the key moments, for example, error detection, when you create a mismatch experience for them. And then they get to experience a tiny bit, but a significant bit 
of the error detection experience. And they, they, they suddenly get what they need to create experientially for their patient in that key moment. You know, through experiencing it in role play, it's still vivid enough that they can get that picture clearly. And then they know it, more than uh, how I got there, what tools I used or what sentence. Sometimes it's about a, about a few keywords or the way I built up the experiential um, experience. The, exper the, the experiential work. Sometimes it's, it's really about the how. But then there is also that, that quality that they get for themselves that then they can take and maybe they will tweak it a little bit, maybe they will apply it their own way, but they know where they need to get at. And that is so such a rich and useful experience for them that, that's, that, that it's why we use it in workshops. It's why we use it in supervision. Uh, playing your one of your difficult patients with a partner and then working your way through that with someone who is not uh, stuck in in the in the case who has a different pers perspective really can take you to another level I, I wonder if, if you this might be a difficult thing to do but do you have an example of like a supervisee that's really been stuck on a specific thing and you role played it and it's been like, oh, that was the thing that they were missing. I imagine it's a broad thing too. So if it's like, it's hard to kind of pin one it's down. A broad thing, but then, but then let's, let's take an example, a striking example of something so simple. I like simple stuff <laughs> because it's, it's so rich uh, and it doesn't seem that way, but then it is. Um, the mismatch experience of helping someone realize that they are no longer the child, the powerless child that they were in a situation and that they are now, now an adult. So this uh, trainee had a client who went through extensive a chronic incest from uh, the, the client's father. And in, uh, in, in the present, that client felt really scared of nearly taking her space, taking her place in life and existing because her emotional learnings were making her anticipate that um, dad would come and get her and that dad would make her life miserable and abuse her again, even if she knew dad lives um, practically in another state very far, hours and hours from her, the patient. And there was such a level of distress and such a level of limbic intensity that it was tricky to create that mismatch experience for the patient. And so we did that in role play. And then um, while playing her client, um, the therapist connected with a detail that may seem trivial, but the, the client is very overweight and very um, at ease uh, about talking about her weight and her appearance and so on and so forth. And then as we were role-playing that whole prediction of her traumatic learning that uh, dad will, will, will come and from behind and dad will just keep her trapped on him um, and, and with with his big arms, and then she's not going to be able to come out. And uh, and then I I was struck by that detail that the client, as an adult, is now very big and heavy. And so I had the idea to to guide experientially, um, feeling herself get bigger and get taller and bigger and heavier and bigger and taller. Right now. Oh, uh, on your dad's lap, okay? To a point that when, when it reached her current weight and height, it seemed so ridiculous that dad was completely engulfed. And, and, and I went over, I, this, the chair breaks or the chair uh, just falls to the ground and then you're completely uh, overwhelming dad. And, the, and, and she, she burst out laughing because it was so striking and so relieving. It was a relieved laugh that it, it would make no sense now to attempt to keep her trapped that way because of her size 
and her weight. It made absolutely no sense to be in that kind of danger again, simply because she had grown. And that that was one, one really great teaching example that sometimes we make things so much more complicated than they are when, when the, the, the contradictory material is right there staring us in the face, right there. And you, you can keep things very simple, but if you guide them well experientially, it's going to be so powerful. And that's what the training experience with that one tiny detail that is unmistakably uh, an experience of being an adult. A child wouldn't be that tall and that heavy compared to an adult like that. And so it made it completely impossible for her to imagine feeling so small and trapped uh, in, in, in that embrace again. And so that's one example I can give you in which the, the, the therapist who didn't know how to bring it up you know, and and not making it a, a such an intellectual, cognitive um, conversation. But you're an adult now. You're tall now. You don't look the same than you did. It was really guided experientially in a very striking manner that made it completely impossible afterwards to feel so powerless and so vulnerable and so helpless and fragile. Well, it's really profound. And and yeah, you could if you. I imagine saying the intellectual well you know you're like an adult now and you're big and tall is um is you're sort of count it's counteractive <laughs> too you're like well don't worry about it you're big now whereas like you had that in your mind and just guided an experience to nudge the client into knowing that themselves which obviously helped significantly more than just saying well you do realize right that you're <laughs> big and an adult now um and mm -hmm. did you did so did the trainee um do this with the client and mm -hmm. it was successful it played out the way the way it did in the role play the client also burst out laughing and had a really fit la laughter and relief you know laughter and relief and laughter and relief and it was very uh a, a nice nice little emotional storm right there that was uh that was within the 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 limb uh, the win limbic window of tolerance for the client so it stayed all within the, the the window of tolerance, but it was a powerful experience that played out pretty similar to what we had experienced uh, in the role play. And, and now that you mention it, it's also for the trainee. It was it was so much better than discussing. Well, you could use the patient's appearance and her weight and her height as contradictory material in order to create a mismatch. Again, being able to experience it uh, in the role play was way more um, rich and powerful as an experience, as a learning experience. Uh, I bet that feels good for you as a trainer when they come back and say, oh, it did, it did exactly what we thought it would do. <laughs> That's yes. great. Yes, yes, yes. You said something earlier on about keeping it simple and... I, you know, obviously, when you're talking about coherence therapy, you're, you know, they're always talking about be talking in and from and being experiential and stuff. And I feel like I, in consultation with other kind of CT folks, there is often like a, I could see even myself, I'm guilty of this too, trying to like create these scenes or experiences that are like kind of far fetched <laughs> and complicated because you're like, oh, it has to be this like this scene and these people need to be there and there's like this and that and um, I just, yeah, speaking to the point of simplicity is often the thing is right there and it doesn't take too much to just invite the client to be in this experience. It doesn't have to have like castles and all <laughs> this like far-fetched stuff. No, nope. you have to think uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the Jenga game with the little blocks. You have to find the Jenga block in the whole building. If you pull that block, the building will collapse. And so that's what you're looking for. You can elaborate that whole complicated strategy, but in the end, it's about pulling the right piece in order for the whole thing to, to fall apart. Yeah. You know what I mean, and so that's the case with that, with that patient. For that particular construct, for that particular emotional learning, there, there was that Jenga piece. It wasn't the only one. There, there, there were other ways in which I could have uh, suggested the, the trainee to guide that. But what what 
came to mind and was right there, right there staring us in the face, ended up being very powerful and what what was sufficient uh, for, for the whole transformation to occur for that particular perception and prediction and the client's yeah. emotional memory. Yeah, and it was right there in the room. It didn't, it didn't, there wasn't, there was no extravagant scene making and actors and yeah. And usually, and that's why, that that's why precision, precision, by the way, in coherence therapy, and that's a skill. <laughs> that's a skill you can practice deliberately as well is that 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 ability to really be precise and surgical about the constructs of the the schema map that you are discovering and integrating with your patient because usually when it seems um, too complicated to create a mismatch to create a contradictory uh, um, an error detection experience for your client usually it's because you haven't gone precisely and deep enough in the in the discovery and sometimes the you know very often the devil is in the details or the jenga is in the details so if you keep going just a little bit more about how it works exactly and what's under this very precisely there is a point when it becomes very obvious to you that this is mismatched with a reality as i know it and this element of the patient's experience can really make that striking and and, and unlock unlock um, the synapses of that particular learning and then I can guide the rewriting of that schema afterwards yeah it's very um complex it's not just I think we spoke about this briefly in the uh, before we recorded about coherence therapy not being something where you can just read the book and go okay now I'm you know I'm going to look out for pro symptom language I'm going to get this kind of schema and then I'm going to disconfirm it because, you know, I felt it in my own sessions, even of like heading there and it's like this watered down, I've gone too quick or I, I haven't, I haven't been specific enough and you get there and you're like, it sounds like it could be that, but it's not that gut punch, like, or gut level. This is the, this is the thing that we're looking to transform now. Um, and it takes so much like deliberate practice to start to shake off all of your sort of, Emotion, own emotional learnings about needing to give the client something and make the session be as quick as they've read it's going to be in the book or like all of that stuff to really be like slower is faster and we need to be really clear and succinct about what it is that we're discovering here like what is underneath mm -hmm. that and I don't think you could I would I would find it hard to believe that you could just read the book and then be like well I get it now you you will get it now it's it's the the principle of memory reconsolidation is quite easy to get, and that's deceptively uh, simple, because you will get you will get what you want to do in therapy very fast, and because it's so um, it, it's so interesting and it's so ex it's it's so um, interesting to to be able to create that change that transformational change in the brain it gets you on board very quickly but then if you want to actually create that in a session then that's when the learning curve hits you it's one thing because it's it's a type of work it's a type of therapy that really needs you to juggle several balls at the same time um and you you really need deliberate practice in order to free up the cognitive space to be able to juggle all those balls at the same time while you are with someone who is experiencing painful emotions and painful memories and so on and so forth. And you need to guide them and accompany them uh, eff efficiently. Um, and um, there was one aspect that I wanted to 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 include. So so there is that um, we, you can call it a double focus. I call it a, a, a triple focus actually in in coherence therapy specifically. Yeah, deceptively simple. So you know you know what you want to achieve in therapy, but when you're actually there, you realize how many skills you need to master 
at the same time, simultaneously, in order to specifically create the set of different experiences that are absolutely needed. That's the thing also about memory reconsolidation, because the brain, the brain will, will not care about what kind of framework you are using, either you are reuniting the, the therapeutic reconsolidation uh, process steps or you're not. Basically, that's that's the black and white thing about it. Either you are, and then transformational change will occur, or you're not. It's as simple as that. And so that part is quite easy to grasp. But the know-how, when you are with someone, and then they, they are constantly showing you new information, new reactions, and then you have to, to put that through your whole process in order to, to know how to handle that and how to react next. That's what the big learning curve is about. And also what's so frustrating at the beginning when you are uh, taking supervision sessions is that um, your, your trainer will uh, help you understand your case or figure out your case uh, very well. And then you come out of your session, your supervision session, and now it's simple again, you get it. You get what you need to do. And then after two minutes with your patient, because you're working in the dark, that's a reality of working with implicit memory. Within two minutes, you will be in the dark again and you will be confused again. And then you don't know what to do again. You knew two minutes ago, but then this and this happened. And now I have to, 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 to consider this and then update my whole, my, my whole plan and what to do next. And then that's the frustrating thing at the beginning. But I promise if you put in the practice, and you you improve on those skills. At some point, uh, you feel that that's less of a hassle, and that that tends to happen less and less. Yeah, yeah, I'm, that's I'm why, really... But that's why you can just read a book and even even a manual, a practice manual, and then just go out there and um, some sometimes of you know um, we're lucky that. In some cases, you will get therapeutic success. You will get, uh, and and um, that encourages you to keep working on it and to keep persevering. But the reality is that uh, you will know what you want to do, and then the the know how will pose uh, a problem here or there, and then you need to 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 work on one skill or another in order to achieve it. Totally. And quite typically, it takes. Typically, it takes a couple of years become, before you become at ease and fluent with that kind of uh, intervention, that kind of therapy. And what makes it so different than protocol-driven uh, frameworks in which you can attend a workshop or you can read the book. And then if you apply that protocol, usually um, it will go the way the protocol says it, it, it will go. It's, it's quite different in those cases. I really connect with a lot of what you shared, especially the oh, okay, I'm going to talk about this client with some someone else who's who's more proficient than me, and now and they gave me the right intervention, and then you go to the session and you do it, and then and then the whole rest of the session after that is is you know you're like blind again, you're like ah, oh, I had it all figured out. <laughs> so really doing, I imagine in those moments, role playing that client would be such a more rich, uh, experiential way to see what is going to come up next. Um, and that's why I love role playing so much because given that the, the 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 partner, the role play partner is not in their own stuff, they are not in their 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 own um, wounds or schemas. You can stop at any time and comment the meta of what is going on right now in in, in my head and what is going on in the, the the session as well. And I love to do that. I love to be able to think out loud and demonstrate at any given moment, at any moment when something key happens or at any moment when I need to really apply the pro-symptom process of the therapist, I can do it out loud. And that's also, by the way, excellent deliberate practice to just uh, practice that little pro-symptom focus uh, steps. If, if you want to do self-supervision and coherence therapy, do that. And you will you will get through the learning curve uh, quite well if you if you do that. 
Um, so, so that's one thing that I really, really like about role plays is that at any moment you can, you can discuss what is going on and, uh, make clarifications if needed and then train people to really deal with that emergent material and then, uh, decide which one you're going to, to follow in order to, to keep the work on track and very precise and also organized because whenever you're dealing uh, with more complex cases and complex implicit memories, uh, it's like um, it's like a windshield. Sometimes you 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 a, a rock hits it, and then you have that nice, clean, big crack through it that's easy to to figure out and follow. And sometimes it just cracks in a whole star shaped pattern. And then when you start following one track, quite easily it's entangled with another schema or another learning and then you have to discover that for a little bit and then you have to get back on track and you have to keep mapping everything as precisely um so um so yeah it allows you to to really uh, illustrate and practice those skills of organizing the information and keeping it uh, coherent in your in uh, in your um case conceptualization yeah, really necessary. I I think that was my point about you can't just read the book and be and be um, fluent in what you've just shared, which is really complicated. Like having that cognitive map: where am I in the process? What have I heard? What's process and relevant? What's my next step? How do I get make the next step? Not a question, but an experience for the client. It's super. Uh, it can be really complicated, and I imagine it's a really great skill to be able to role play and for you to go well here I am on the map of where I'm going and like I imagine that's a really rich experience for people and uh an impressive and it's, skill and it's great deliberate practice for me because actually yeah. it's one of the ways you can learn the best is to explain to imagine that you're explaining it to someone so being able to explain what is going on out loud it's also amazing deliberate practice for me and so that's also something you can do at home to try and explain what is going on. Even if you're watching one of your sessions, okay, here, imagine that you're explaining to a trainee what, what you were uh, intending of, uh, of, of doing clinically and why and where you're at in the process and why and what you have learned so far from the client and what, what's the pro-symptom relevance of that and so on and so forth. So that's something that you can that whole inner process that you need to to integrate and master certainly uh explaining it out loud to an imaginary partner is uh, is also a great deliberate practice that you can do that's great um i'm conscious of our time we've only got a few minutes that's gone so quick um i'm wondering if there's any like if, if as people are listening to this and sort of thinking about starting this type of process like how would you where would you guide them to start in terms of deliberate practice uh like i mentioned uh, definitely the coherent psychology institute made this little i i like to call it the wheel oh, the cue uh, card process the cue card with the different steps uh and and you would be amazed at how many times in supervision i have to remind people of the first step which is stop 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 and sometimes stop the session okay it's it's uh in itself it's uh sometimes very um un uncomfortable to ask the client to for, for a second to just uh, gather our thoughts but there are ways to do that very respectfully and 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 making people feel considered and that we're really really working hard to to find the best way to help them um, and so that that little cue card with all the steps is definitely something that you can uh, you can use for a deliberate practice. And again, you could use videos of your sessions. You could use uh, someone else's videos that at, at any moment you feel something important has just happened or emerged in terms of content, then stop the video, stop, and then do the rest of the process out loud if you want. Um, in front of your computer or with a, a practice partner. That's excellent deliberate practice. Um, I have designed modules of deliberate practice for coherence therapy. Uh, I think those uh, those are also skills, uh, important skills in coherence therapy. So in those, I have a module that will help you 
hear the limbic language in a little snippet of dialogue that the client might might tell you and then you have to distill uh, boil down the the elements of the index card that you need um, to make explicit the, the pro symptom position of the client and then there is also a skill of um, placing the different elements of the schema map so what's the existential problem with the worst suffering uh, what's the solution if there is a solution and uh, what's the means to um, implement that solution that's that people get so confused between the solution and the symptom sometimes so there's a, a deliberate practice for specifically that skill and then uh, also the matrix that i created uh, in in my workshop um, that helps you map uh, the the schema map uh, and the construct in three different ways. I will not get into those details here uh, because that's not the topic. But to, to to one of the most useful, I think, for the for for that kind of deliberate practice would be to figure out what's uh, in in terms of inner resources and outer resources. What's what what does the the existential problem say about what's problematic? about my resources, inner and outer. And then same thing with the threats. So internal threats and external threats, uh, what seems to be the perceived problem uh, that's behind that, the necessity of producing that particular symptom. So that's a set of skills in itself. And then also um, something that's very popular in supervision, how do I create juxtaposition experiences? How do I find contradictory material? So uh, it's a whole set of skills to be able to see different angles for juxtaposition. Like Bruce Ecker says, people have contradictory experiences every single day. The art is to highlight which ones are the best to unlock specific learnings and then rewrite them and guide that whole process. So that's another set of skills. So same thing, you start with a complete index card of a complete schema map, and then you have to figure out, okay, what could be a good contradictory material for that kind of schema? What, what would be the best Jenga in that uh, schema map? So that's also a set of skills. So, and, and, and probably I will think of other kind of deliberate practice uh, material that people could use uh, for that kind of experiential therapy. It's really, uh, it's it's a lot of work, but it's really fun to do because I I, I am very, very uh, involved in finding the best ways to help people along that uh, merciless, <laughs> that, uh, that cruel learning curve <laughs> in coherence therapy. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's so great that you've got all that stuff available. And we'll, we'll link all of that your site and where to access those things at the bottom of the video. Um, Thank you. But yeah, I really can feel the, the the learning curve. You can you can think, oh, I'm actually I understand it. I'm getting it. This is, and then you're <laughs> suddenly you're back down there again. And yeah, it takes a lot to maintain um, just maintain everything you're learning in your mind and, and oh. being intentional. Like right. I remember I was pulling my hair. I was no longer sure what a symptom was. It's it's really humbling uh, the way the way you have sometimes to unlearn and then relearn a whole set of therapeutic skills uh, in order to practice efficiently with that kind of framework. But then it is so rewarding. Like like uh, we discussed, you 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 don't go back after that. Once once you have crossed the mirror. Uh, you you want to stay there and uh, get get more fluid at this, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And it is possible too, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time, Sophie. This was really wonderful. And um, you, you have a lot of wisdom about this very thing. And yeah, just really grateful to have spent this uh, hour with you. It was a pleasure, pleasure to spend that hour with you. Thank you great. so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Take good care. Take good care as well.